Right, that's B for Belgian brains. So, what can science tell us about consciousness? Nothing, some of my colleagues would say. We don't know what it is. We can't define it, leave it alone. I would really disagree. I think science can and should study consciousness. And I would like to um, share with you some of our difficulties in quantifying consciousness. And I'm supposed, as a neurologist, to know what I mean when seeing a patient and concluding he's comatose, unconscious, or when he's recovering consciousness. So how do we do it? I'd like to have a little experiment here. So you'll be the patient. The first thing we'll do is to reduce the complexity of consciousness to the first component, that's the level of consciousness. So that's quite easy. I will look for scoring your wakefulness, whether you have your eyes wide open. Okay? Those of you who are dozing in, I'd stimulate you because wakefulness is necessary, but as we'll see, not sufficient for you to be aware. Now, being aware, I hear used in a slightly different sense than our most famous Belgian philosopher, <laughs> Jean-Claude Van Damme, the muscles from Brussels. What I mean by awareness is your external awareness, everything you see and feel and hear right now, and that's going through your senses. And then on top of that internal awareness, that's that little voice talking to yourself, you thinking about your future, your past, <clears throat> internal awareness. And that is a bit more tricky for us to quantify the content of consciousness. So let me, please stay with me, assess your awareness. So I would ask you a question. Check if there is a response to a simple command, like each and every one here, raise your right arm. Okay. Many did, a couple didn't. I'm not sure we could conclude that those who didn't are not aware, right? I think this is very important to emphasize. What we're doing as physicians, trying to quantify awareness, actually is looking at motor responsiveness. And our patients in coma often are paralyzed. So a patient in coma, by definition, cannot be awake, and so they will never open the eyes, even if we stimulate them, and hence, they're considered unaware. Now, coma will only last for a couple of days to weeks, and some of these patients will show some very bizarre dissociation between wakefulness and awareness. They will awaken, eyes wide open, just as you, they would move and breathe spontaneously, but when all the movements are considered reflexes, we consider they're vegetative. They're in a state of wakeful unawareness. And that's very unusual. We're not used to see people there, eyes wide open, yes, unconscious. And the big challenge for us is to identify, as soon as possible, those small, minimal signs of consciousness. And they can be very minimal, and you get them now, and they're gone a couple of hours later. So this is really a problem, and those patients with chronic disorders of consciousness, in contrast to coma, they can stay in this condition without any possibility of communication for years, for decades. And I'm afraid that medicine and society has been neglecting these artifacts of modern medicine. So, let me share some, three actually, clinical realities, extraordinary realities. And the first one, are those patients who, after a severe brain damage, that can be a trauma or a cardiac arrest, are in coma and then evolve to brain death. That is when all brain function is gone. So here, I think, it's important we use these new technologies, and you see an image there where we inject a sugar, a radioactively labeled glucose. It goes into the brain that uses a lot of energy, and so you see in your brain right now, I hope, there should be a lot of activity in your gray matter, in your cortex, those billions of neurons. It's all red and yellow. It's using a lot of sugar. 
In brain death, we see the empty skull sign. There's only the skin surrounding um, the skull that is still using some energy, but not in those billions of neurons. Here, you can safely donate your organs. Because, yes, we do have scientific evidence that there's life after death. It is called organ donation. And it's very important. <laughs> it's very important. Physicians are very transparent about that. And we're not used to see somebody in intensive care. The heart is beating. They feel warm, breathing through the machine. And when the brain is dead, your death, I think, this is a very important and first extraordinary uh, clinical reality. Another one I would like to briefly touch upon are those patients who survive their coma. And they would tell us afterwards that they had this extraordinary experience. They left their own body, they saw a light, saw their relatives, they felt good. These near-death experiences. And again, I think that science and medicine has neglected this reality for far too long. So I have a little request. If anyone here had a near-death experience or know somebody who had, please come and contact us, because I think science, again, should study this phenomenon um, scientifically. The third extraordinary um, clinical reality are indeed these patients who survive their coma, awaken, yet remain unaware. These patients, in so-called vegetative state, unresponsive wakefulness, where with these brain scans, as you see, we can show that there is a very abnormal brain activity. It's all blue, it's less than half of normal um, uh, values we see in, in, in normal consciousness. Now, I think one of our um, important discoveries, I think, is that we were able to, um, for those patients who recovered from this condition, from a vegetative state, do this study again. And what we saw is not that the brain resumes a normal activity all over, it just recovered in some specific parts of the brain. In other words, you don't need your whole brain to be aware. And I think this is very important to be able to identify the critical brain network. And you see it there. It's not a small consciousness region. It's a network. It's in red the external awareness network, both sides in the front and in the back, and then in blue, the midline, front and back again, this internal awareness network, important for you having these internal discussions. And the arrows are there to show how important it is that these um, networks communicate with each other, that they interact um, within and between each other. Now you could say, why would this matter? Well, I think there's maybe three reasons. Um, first of all, it does matter whether a patient is fully unconscious or whether there is a little bit of consciousness. For example, for our treatment of pain. Again, we can use these new machines, neuroimaging um, tools, to go and look what's happening in your brain when you feel pain. It's not a small spot, it's a network. You see it here on these transparent brains. When you look at brain death, no activity whatsoever. No brain, no pain. Patients <laughs> who are surviving their coma evolve to this bizarre dissociation of vegetative state, um, wakeful unawareness. They will activate their brain stem. This is um, deep in the brain, important for wakefulness. And also, you see a bit of their cortex, but it's the sensory cortex. It's like a slave system. It's isolated, it's disconnected from this awareness network, and so not enough for uh, you to have a conscious experience. And I think it's very important that we observe that those patients with very small signs of consciousness, like following with their eyes, um, or sometimes responding to a command, showed the whole pain network that activated. In other words, these patients can't, by definition, communicate that they would feel any pain, but their brain scans tell us we should systematically treat for pain. Well, this brings me to the next uh, important um, 
issue of trying to give these patients a voice, trying to use these technologies to establish a communication. And this is an image of the first patient ever on this planet where we could use functional imaging to establish a communication. So this patient was sent to Liège with this label vegetative, put him in the fMRI scanner, and we see this activation when we ask a question. Uh, and you see the activation is the blue spot. It's a very damaged brain, so there's a lot of black there. The black is the fluid, actually taking the place of the brain. There's, uh, at some places, uh, very little brain left. Again, you don't need a lot of brain to be conscious. And then we can use this with some tricks to read when we see blue, it's a no. When other areas in red activate, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a yes and it's a no, and we can communicate only with these uh, novel technologies, really giving some of these patients, this is exceptional, um, their right for autonomy. And then the third reason, I think, is that these new imaging technologies permit us to better um, assess the chances of recovery. And therefore, we use, and I just would like to show this little object, which is my brain, printed in 3D. It's the connections within my brain. I think it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> so I took my spare brain today. And when we measure this in patients with a severe brain trauma or after a cardiac arrest, we can use that information to predict the outcome and to make the right decisions when there's no chance of recovery, when we should increase all our efforts, and that's, of course, a very important life or death decision uh, where these measurements, I think, will help us in the future. So, in sum, I think that the study of coma and related uh, conditions has permitted us to identify the critical um, brain networks for awareness. And it's my hope that, um, as an integrated um, international scientific effort, we'll use um, that information and we'll continue to increase our understanding of the mystery of consciousness, and then use that knowledge to improve our care for these very um, vulnerable patients with chronic disorders of consciousness after a severe brain damage. Thank you for your attention.